My name is Nolan Priest, and we are very happy to have Al Weber here for our town 2000. He has uh, chosen to do a retrospective. Don't let him kid you. He's a skinny little kid from Utah State that I met, well, at least two years ago. <laughs> and uh, it's a, it, my, my place and where I am in my work, it's a real pleasure when you go around and bump into someone and like Nolan and Stuart and going around, there's so many of you that I've met or seen earlier and now I'm getting a chance to get a second crack at you. Oh, yeah, okay. kind of thing. <laughs> the idea of talking to you about some esoteric statement, it's just not my style, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a commercial photographer, always have been a commercial photographer. I have a strong dislike and distrust for most people in the fine arts. Uh, I really like commercial work, and so my favorite, if the photographs that you're looking at, people sometimes ask me which are my favorites. My favorites are the ones that earn the most money. <laughs> and everything else is in between. I look at myself as a photographer the same way that a good carpenter looks at their skill in carpentry. My job is just to do the photograph right, in the way that the customer wants it. And once in a while you sneak one in for yourself. But most of these photographs, many of these photographs were done on assignment, and I like that. My wife likes it, my three sons like it, everyone likes it when dad comes home with a check. And I find that to be satisfying for me. You hear some conversation frequently about people looking down their noses one way or the other. Well, I look down my nose at fine art photography. To me, it's something that you do when you're just messing around. But when I'm serious, the dollar sign comes out and yeah, that kind of gets my uh, juices flowing and I really like to do photographs for money, for your money, or anyone else's money too. But over the years, I've had the pleasure of all my commercial work being friendly, being something I, I wanted to do. When I first moved to California, like everyone else that moves to California, you're broke. And so my early work was, I did a lot of children that one, this one. But I did children's photographs, and I can't think of anything I've ever photographed in my life that I enjoyed more than photographing children. And I think the reason for that is that children are not human beings. They are little urchins that come from a different planet <laughs> until a certain age, and you have the pleasure of working with this creature for a while. And then eventually they go up and become, you know, a person and then they get dull. But when they're at this age, they're so much fun. And to think that I used to do that for money, and not only had the fun of doing it, but uh, earned a living too. In, in my work, I've migrated from that. And my last commercial work was architectural work like on the back wall back there in Europe. Most of my architectural work in Europe was in Finland. I went there to photograph a building, the one on the left, and uh, that should have taken about two or three hours, and I stayed three years uh, because Finland is really a swell place. The people are so honest and they're so smart. They just seem to know how to do things better than other people do. And it was really a pleasure to work there. After three years, they finally asked me to leave because they're very bigoted about, you know, why should we allow you to take our money when the, you, there's a Finnish photographer that will do the work? So they invited me to leave after three years. But I got a good run, and I still talk to them. And I just had, I can't tell you how much pleasure it was uh, to work with people that are so dedicated and so honest. The uh, photograph in the middle in Helsinki, which is a pretty nice city, incidentally, two million people, uh, that's the back of, uh, of a downtown city block, and it usually is reserved for service, 
people to pick up the trash and deliver goods and stuff. Well, now that because of the space requirements, the Finns are converting all those alleyways to malls, and that's what that is. It's a, a place where you can go and get coffee. There's a, a health food place, and there was a, a gymnasium and a good bar, and that's what they're doing. And I was photographing there, and I was waiting for the light. And I think this is good for you to know, because Reno's not quite downtown Chicago or New York, and there's some of you from up in Quincy where there's a touch of this kind of thing. And I'm photographing and I'm waiting for the light, and the architect that I'm working for comes along and says, well, I can see what you're waiting for. Let's go to lunch. <laughs> and and uh, so I said, I don't want to go to lunch because I have to take my camera down. I use a 4x5 Sinar, and it's bulky, and the electronic flash units, and they're bulky. And he said, you don't have to take them down, just leave them. This is right in the middle of town. And uh, so I said, I'm not going to leave my $10,000, no, $20,000 worth of equipment on the street, you know? And he said, trust me, there's no, nothing to worry about. So we went to lunch. And all the time we're at lunch, I'm looking out the window at my camera, you know, wondering, oh boy, someone's going to nail me. Well, an old man came along, older than me, and uh, he looked at the camera, and then he sat down on the camera case. And he didn't do anything else, he just sat there. So we went back after lunch, and he was sitting there, and the architect asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I was afraid someone would bump into it. <laughs> Try that downtown United States, any place. You know, I would get people that would come up to me on the street and just want to practice their English, just want to talk to you for a minute. And it's kind of refreshing instead of having some cop come up behind you and say, Where's your permit? You know, so that's kind of what I'm about. If you got any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. But again, uh, they expect me in New Mexico to talk about West Coast vision. Well, I went to a, a glasses shop in the Del Monte Shopping Center that sells all kinds of glasses, and they didn't have any glasses for West Coast vision. And I don't quite get it what this jazz is about West Coast vision or something like that. David Vessel and I just finished a workshop in Montana. And we had people from, we had one doctor from Alberta, we had two people from Connecticut, we had a man from Florida, we had two people from New Mexico, two people from Idaho, and the usual Californians. And they're all the same. They all got the same vision. They all like the same things. They all wanted the same thing from David and me, and that would just help us make a little better picture. You know, a little see if you can tighten our craft up a little bit. There's nothing special about someone just because they live on the West Coast. That's a marketing scam as far as I'm concerned. And it started back maybe in 1932 with the advent of the F-64 group. And people started saying that these people started something. Well, the people that really started that go predate F-64 people by 50 years in Germany. And then people like Moholy Naj and Ache come along, and they were all doing it. But you know what? They didn't have a publicity manager. And that makes a big difference. So some of us work for the pleasure of working. Some of us work scared to death that someone's not going to spell our name right. And you have to make that decision yourself. I know where I am, and uh, you have to figure out where you are yourself. I like photography. I don't care whether it's color or black and white or digital or non-silver, platinum, palladium, whatever. If it's made in a photographic manner, I like it. And when someone does something very well, all I care is that it's done very well and it's done with care. And, uh, but I started out printing color in 1948, printing the old dye transfer process when I was just a kid. And I like that. And I like printing color a lot. Uh, I've had some people in this room 
that I've worked with, like Anita here. Uh, and I've always enjoyed the color process. But when it really comes down to push and shove, there's just nothing to me that I'm more comfortable with than going in a black and white dark room. I have a good one. It's, it's very well laid out. It has seven good enlargers in it. So if I, I, I have a very short attention span. And so if I get started with a print, I can lose interest before the print is finished. And so what I like to do is just turn the enlarger off and step over three feet to the next enlarger. And so in my dark room, it goes from 35 millimeter to eight by 10. And they're all set up to do both color and black and white. But it's been two or three years since I've done a color print in a dark room. All my color prints today are either earlier Siba crumbs, like some of these back on this wall, or uh, they've been this, the transparencies or negatives have been scanned, photoshopped, and print, printed out on crystal archival material. But I have, we all have critics. We all have people that we look to for advice and to give us a hand uh, to maybe straighten us out. And my most severe critic is my wife, Suzy. And I hate to tell you, well, I don't hate to tell you anything. I don't mind digital prints, I like them. But my wife doesn't like them. So guess what? I'm not gonna do digital prints anymore. <laughs> it's just that simple, you know? I probably will, but uh, I, 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 I will have to do it totally myself. Everything I do, someone asked me about cutting mats. I've never had anyone cut a mat for me. I wouldn't know where to go to get that done. And I probably would be too stingy to do it. I like to cut mats myself. I like to take the time to lay the print out and select the mat board I want and, and do all that myself. It's just part of, the, part of the process of being totally self-contained. One of my concerns today in the arts is that we are losing a tactile character in all of our arts. We're letting machines take over for us. And I still like these 10 fingers. I like to get into the trays. I like to cut my own mats. I like mechanical cameras that don't tell me what to do. I tell them what to do. And I'll fight for that as long as I'm working. Uh, and then someone else wants to do something different, that's fine. They can do something different, but uh, not me. When I was putting the show together, I realized there's another binding photograph back here from Colorado. I realized that I wasn't getting enough of my commercial work in. And in 1984, I was hired by Kaiser to photograph their mining operations as a uh, lobby presentation to go to Washington, D.C. and show how good coal mining can be. And if you believe that, what's that old story about a Brooklyn Bridge? Uh, but so I went to York Canyon in New Mexico, which is 20 or 30 miles out of Raton. And I went to Sunnyside, Utah, which is very close to Desolation Canyon and then the Santa Rafael Swell. And I photographed coal mining. But the problem I ran into when I got to Sunnyside, there was a page out of a book thumbtacked to the bulletin board in the wash house. Coal miners go to a wash house where they change clothes. Then they put their street clothes on a pulley and they pull them up to the ceiling and everyone's clothes are up there. Then they step outside and they get on a tram that's like, like uh, a roller coaster tram. It's very low and it goes very, very fast and it takes them into the, through the portal into the coal mine. Maybe some of you are familiar with this kind of a thing. Well, on the bulletin board was a page out of Richard Avedon's book called Workers of the West. And scrawled across the page was, is he going to make us look like this? <laughs> Richard Avedon searched the West with a team and only found people that were unusual, 
like we usually call him a freak in the circus, and he called these people workers of the West, and these people were highly insulted. So I took it upon myself that if I'm going to photograph workers of the West, I want to make them look good. I don't want them to be pretty, but I want them to look like good, honest American working type people. So the first man, uh, was about a third generation coal miner. His father was a coal miner, his grandfather was a coal miner, and that was at the 1,200 foot level. So that old cliche about being dark in a coal mine, you just don't know how dark it is in a coal mine. It is really dark. So if I was going to photograph a man like that, and he's standing right here where Larry is, all I can do is hear his voice. There's no way in the world I can see him. So I was shooting with a Hasselblad super wide, pre-focused at three feet with a flash unit attached to it. And I would just tell him, keep talking. And I would walk up to him. And when I could reach out and touch him, that's the picture. And what you see is what you get. Or there's nothing dynamic about it. It's a very simple point and shoot approach. But then the work in this case comes at that funny place called Photoshop, right? <laughs> Doing a little work and that kind of thing. But working for the coal mines, the coal mining people, really was almost like going to Finland. And I realized that in my work, it seems like I just go from one job to another and they all get better. They just are more fun. The coal miners were serious people and yet they were full of life. And in a town like Sunnyside, it's a company town. Everything there is owned by the mine. The schools, the hospitals, the housing, they even have their own ski run. And those people are perfectly happy. They really like what they're doing. And they're well paid and uh, they wouldn't think about leaving. So when you ask about it, uh, and some of you wonder what uh, maybe what you want to do next, well, don't give up the idea of going to Utah and being a coal miner. You might be surprised. But you get down in the mines with these people and you realize all of a sudden in seconds you're 12, 1,500 feet down, and they sing while they work. They can't see each other, but they sing. And they're very, very up during the day. Well, as a photographer, my job is to somehow get a hold of that, get it on film. I guess, I guess if I went today, I'd have to get it on one of those silly little chips. And I, but uh, I still kind of like the old stuff called film. Can I tell you a war story to, to connect you with this? Well, just to show you that I'm not overly bright. Uh, when it was time for me to join the service, I joined the Marine Corps. And Hal was a Marine, and two or three of the others of you are too. But we uh, showed our intelligence by joining the Corps. And I got sent to this funny little place called Korea. And there's a lot of things about things like that, but the one thing that was outstanding to me was it was really cold. And one day they came around and said that they were looking for an aerial observer. And the only thing I asked them was, does the airplane have a heater? <laughs> and when they told me it did, I said, I'm your man. Well, I started working in the air there in what was called an L-119, which is a very, very small airplane. And absolutely delightful visual uh, thing because you fly it just a few hundred feet off the ground and everything is just right there and it's very sharp and I liked it so well and I liked the heater too that when I got out of the service I continued doing aerial photography I used to rent planes from Del Monte Aviation in Monterey they had an old Aronka which is a fabric covered airplane and it didn't have parking brakes and it didn't have a starter. So <clears throat> I would have to sit in the cockpit and keep my feet on the brakes 
and the throttle while the pilot got out and prop started it. And downhill with a tailwind, we could sometimes get up to 60 miles an hour. So it gave you a lot of time to, to look at things. But to me, be flying along in an airplane with a camera, look down, and there's Ansel Adams walking, carrying a camera on his shoulder. I think, now for me, why, why walk when you can fly? You know? And I really like small airplanes. They're, they're alive, they have spirit, and I like to have that transmitted into the work as much as possible. I don't like to fly high, I like to fly very low. This is a bus landing at uh, maybe four, 400 feet, something like that. And when you fly over agricultural land in particular, and you open the windows, you can smell the earth. You can smell the agriculture, and it's really nice. And then you get the pleasure of photographing it. So that worked. This photograph right straight behind you, uh, the Salinas River breaking the sandbar. In California, we have this wonderful thing that happens every spring when all the rivers that have dried up over the winter all of a sudden get their water and they break a sandbar and run out to the ocean. And the colors are magnificent. And we don't have one here to show it, but what happens is all that mud goes out in the ocean. So you have a turquoise ocean and all the mud looks like Hershey's chocolate. And it's delightful, it's delicious. So photographing from the air is neat. And there's a lot of people that think that flying is dangerous, so they pay you extra. So you see where that's another reason I like aerial photography. You get more money for it. Yeah. Yeah. It keeps peace at home. Thank you for coming.